In this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about a process called, that I'll call tuning the loadings, which is where you decide to eliminate some of the components of the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. And I'll talk about what, why you might want to do that, and I'll go over two different uh, strategies for doing that, two popular strategies. But the main part of this lecture is a set of examples. We're going to look at three different examples, and I think they're all kind of fun. Um, the first one is relatively straightforward. Uh, we're going to look at a collection of data from the 1970s, I think the late 1970s, trying to categorize uh, European nations' uh, economies based on a bunch of uh, 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 features that describe these nations and see if you can use principal component analysis to kind of group them or to kind of see patterns or something like that. So that's the first one. It's relatively straightforward. The second one is a sort of new style uh, of problem for us. It's a, it's a genetics problem, and it has this characteristic feature, uh, which is that the number of variates is enormous compared to the number of observations. So I think there's something like 39 people that were studied, and we have something like 60,000 uh, uh, variates that describe each of those people. Uh, I think we, we reduce that right away down to, or someone else has done it for us, uh, it gets reduced down to something like 30,000 or something like that, maybe 13,000, I can't remember. It's still a big number though, still uh, way, way more uh, features than observations. And so that, that's going to introduce some challenges for us. Um, and we're going we're gonna to try to assess uh, this, this pretty vast data set, data set um, just in terms of a couple of principal components, and we'll see whether or not that's wise. And um, we'll see if, if we can kind of learn anything about it. Uh, particularly, we're going to be looking at uh, groups of men and women and uh, trying to understand a problem of obesity uh, in, this, in this particular group of people. And then the, the last problem uh, is, is also pretty interesting. It's a different type of problem for us. It's a it's sort of a computer vision type of problem. We're going to look at a collection of I think it's student ID photos uh, from Stanford, maybe. I'm not actually totally sure where they come from. I think it's Stanford. Um, and we're going to apply this, uh, this analysis strategy called eigenfaces to these, uh, to these ID photos. And we're going to try to sort of uh, see if we can kind of make some sense out of uh, using a principal component analysis, kind of like decompose the, the images for the different faces. Uh, it's it's maybe, maybe a little bit of a retro kind of computer vision uh, uh, strategy, but it's, it's still pretty interesting and, and fun. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, let's get started. The, today's lecture is almost entirely code and examples, but I did want to say a little small amount of theory stuff uh, right at the start, and then we can get on to the, to the code. Um, I mainly just wanted to say something about tuning the matrix of loadings. Uh, so we'll call this tuning the loadings. And this can be useful if you want to just sort of simplify the matrix of loadings, uh, make it look a little bit, or maybe not, not have it be so uh, fine grained or something. So the idea behind this is the following. So in case you've forgotten, the matrix of loadings uh, looks like this. It, you could write it as the transpose of this, but uh, that's fine too. It slightly changes the, the instructions here. Um, but so we've been referring to the matrix loadings, matrix of loadings as a transpose, and its columns are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Uh, sorry, that's a alpha one. And it makes up a column here like this. And then there are P of these. So there's P different columns of this matrix of loadings. And so each of these, so, so it's made from eigenvectors. of the covariance matrix, right? And so that is to say, uh, a sigma multiplying alpha hat i is just equal to a constant 
uh, the, the eigenvalue times alpha hat i. Right, so we've talked about that a bunch. So the idea is sometimes you might want to ignore small values of the components of the eigenvectors, or rather small value, small elements in the matrix of loadings. So sometimes drop small elements. or small values. All right, and so the idea is you do the following. You say, you say, okay, if the absolute value of some AIJ, some, some element of the matrix of loadings is below some threshold, um, then I, I make it zero. Let's change it to zero, set it to zero. So that's the idea behind this. And uh, I think you can understand if you did this, it would sort of just simplify the matrix of loadings. Uh, you would not really have any fine noise going on, um, depending on what your criteria was for determining that threshold. And I just want to uh, describe two different schemes uh, for picking that threshold. So two threshold screen schemes. Right, and the first one, um, this one is where you set one threshold for each eigenvector, right? So this is one threshold per eigenvector. And this thing, or, or column, in the case of writing the matrix of loadings the way we've done here, if you refer to the matrix A as the matrix of loadings, then this would be referring to the rows. Uh, but really, what's important to understand is you're, you're talking about the eigenvectors. So one threshold per eigenvector means you do something like the following. Uh, this is a very specific example of it, but you say, okay, the threshold and again, there's one for each eigenvector. So let's say we call we index the eigenvectors by J um, is going to be 70%, 0 0.7 times the largest of its components. Oops, sorry. The maximum value over I of these guys. Right, so this is maximizing along one row of the matrix of loading, sorry, along one column of the matrix of loadings here. The I index is, is row, and so we're maximizing down the row, uh, or <laughs> along a column going down rows. Boom, 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 boom. I hope that makes sense. Uh, you're, you're trying to pick off the largest uh, component of the eigenvector. And you say that if any other components are smaller than 70% of that, oh, which is a relatively, uh, uh, I don't know, that's a relatively uh, strict condition, um, then you're just going to throw it out and you make it zero. And this condition, uh, this is called, so this condition of having uh, the elements be smaller. So this condition here. Uh, is called, sometimes it's called this. Uh, I don't think it's a super uh, uniform or standard name, but some people call this Mardia's criterion, named after a statistician whose last name is Mardia. Right, and so that will that will set a whole lot of values to zero anything that's below 70%. And we saw stuff like hap this happening when we first used principal component analysis in R, and we used the old-fashioned, uh, or the, the, the less recent um, 
algorithm. A lot of things got actually set to zero, and that might have been using Marty as criterion. I'm not sure what was the criterion that was being used there. Um, and then the the last the other uh, criterion I'm going to make or the thresh, the threshold scheme thresholding scheme that I want to describe is just one universal threshold. Uh, so it's based on the number of uh, variates in the problem. So you see each of these eigenvectors is a uh, unit vector so they each have length one and so that that you can kind of make just a universal uh, threshold that's based not so much well, partly on the magnitude of one but but also on just the number of dimensions and so that threshold looks like this you say that the threshold value is one over the square root of p uh, where p is the number of variates or the number of features Right, and the reason for that, I hope, is somewhat clear. So I'll draw a little picture. Um, so let's suppose these are your two uh, variates. So we'll do a p equals two case. Right. Um, if you had an eigenvector of length one in this space, uh, so I'll use a different color for it. Right. So if that had length one, then this point here, uh, well, so we can look at this, oops. So this length here is one over square root of two. And this is one over square root of two. So that this point here is at one over square root of two along the x axis and one over square root of two, or the horizontal axis rather, and one over square root of two and, and the vertical axis. And you can see if you did this in three dimensions, uh, the same kind of story would hold except that the the length in which you go out along each each axis would be one over square root of three and if you did it in five dimensions it'd be one over square root of five and so on and so this is this is the whole uh the general idea of wh where this threshold comes from so it's one threshold for the whole uh, scheme but it's determined by the number of variates in your problem Okay, and so that, that's all I wanted to say in terms of theoretical stuff today. Uh, so we're going to go on to some examples, uh, and we're going to do three examples. All right, so we're going to do three different examples. And this first one, we're going to use a relatively small data set. Um, it's stored in a file called jobseurope.txt. And it's small enough that we can actually just look at it. And so I'll just dump it to the screen, um, and we can take a look at it. This is some old data from the 1970s, and what you see, so one, <laughs> one way you can see that it's old is that the names of the countries, which are, which are in the first column here, some of them are old. So like uh, East Germany is on their uh, GDR, Czechoslovakia, so some of these places aren't countries anymore, um, USSR, so Yugoslavia, have I got them all? Are there any one, other ones that I've missed? That are no longer countries. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, so I'll just describe this data. So this is the whole data set that you're looking at uh, here. And it, each column, with the exception of the first one, which is a country name, and the last one, uh, describes the portion of the country's employment that is in a particular industry. So AGR stands for agriculture. And so Belgium has three, at that time, in the I think it was 1974, had 3.3% uh, of its employment in agriculture. So that's, for example, that's what this means. The last number, I'll say something about at the end, but it has something to do with the size of the economy for the country. And so I'll, uh, I detail this stuff in the text of the code of the notebook file here. So it's, it's from, oh, it's, oh, sorry, it's from 1979. There's 26 countries, so each row is a country, and these are the different industries, agriculture, mining, manufacturing, energy, construction, service industries, finance, social and personal services, and transportation and communication. And the, the last one, so each of those is a percentage of employment in that industry. The last column, which we won't use, is um, the gross national product per capita 
in, I believe the units are thousands of US dollars, but we're going to throw this one out anyways. So, um, so we're going to go up here and we're going to strip out the numerical data. So columns, uh, whatever it is, uh, strip out the first and last column before we do our principal component analysis. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and try that. And so I'm going to do that here. So we'll do columns two through 10. And we're going to just do a scree plot, which you can do, you can produce with this command scree plot, uh, just to take a look at the size of the the variances. And those are shown here. So this is, this has nine different principal components. Um, and it's a pretty steep fall off after the first one uh, goes down to 50. This doesn't look at things in terms of proportion of variance, which you probably should do, uh, but it just gives you an impression just by taking a quick look here uh, that you might want to chop off. Uh, you might want to just look at the first index or, or, or the first component or the first two. That would probably be pretty good, the first two. Um, okay, and so uh, the next thing I want to do is take a look at um, the actual scores and the loadings. So the scores we see here um, or sorry, the scores are the, the output, uh, the transform data, and the loadings are the eigenvectors. So let's see if I can do this. Does this give me the result? This shows me, yeah, so this first command um, is going to show me the loadings, which are here. So the standard deviations are here, which we just looked at. Those are the eigenvalues. Um, but here are the individual vectors. So this matrix is the matrix of loadings. And you can see how what would happen if we were to apply, say, um, the the criteria that I described before. So a lot of these things would go away. So that would that's definitely smaller than seventy percent of ninety or eighty nine. So these a lot of these things would be out. So maybe only agriculture, manufacturing, and so on would contribute to this first pr principal component, um, and then it would change further as you went down. So. Um, this this algorithm again, uh, Prin, which one is this? This one, PR Comp. This this is the newer algorithm, um, the one that uses singular value decomposition, and it doesn't uh, throw out any. It doesn't apply any of those criteria for uh, dropping pieces of the matrix of loadings. It just keeps the whole thing. Um, okay, and, and so we're going to look at the first three principal components. Right, or at least I am for the looking at the data. I want to see the uh, scores. Uh, and in in the old algorithm, this would actually be called scores here. This matrix is stored as scores, but in the newer algorithm, it's just stored as x. Um, and you can see it here. So this is not very informative to look at these uh, by themselves. It's already too much information to be looking at by hand. But you know, these are like the sort of three components for the first. These are the the locations of each of the observations along the, the axes of the first three principal components. So like this guy here is, what did we say that one was? Belgium, I think. Belgium, yeah. So Belgium is that first row, uh, but described on the principal components. And so what we're trying to do here is to see if we can understand sort of some kind of economic picture here and see if the principal components kind of uh, are enough, a small number of them are enough to discriminate or see patterns um, in the countries. Um, so again, we'll, we'll plot these things. So let's do that. We'll plot the first two. It's, it's always easiest to do uh, two dimensional plots. And I've labeled each of the points with their country. I've also put red X's on these because uh, I thought having the names on there, some of the names are long enough, like Czechoslovakia, that you might not know where the point actually is. It's in the middle uh, of the word that's being written there. And Turkey, for some reason, got clipped off the side here, and so did Sweden and Netherlands. Um, but so th here's the little code here that does this. And so those are this is how the data looks on the pr first two principal components. So you might, I don't know, want to look at these and see if you recognize any of these countries, uh, see any kind of patterns going on here. Um, I'm not sure if I see any straight away, uh, but anyway, so this is how you can uh, study this this problem. So I don't know, do you see, so it shows, for example, what do we have here? Sweden, Norway, and Netherlands, all three are in relatively similar positions on the principal components. 
and they're pretty different from Yugoslavia, say. Um, East Germany is sort of near Switzerland um, in, in this, in this uh, the first two principal components. So I don't know what you might glean from this, but you certainly could uh, try to see if this separates the countries in any particular way. And you can explore this and try to look at the other principal components and try to apply the different criteria and stuff and see if you can uh, get something more interesting out of it. All right, uh, the second example is a pretty different kind of data set than the type that we've been using so far. It's a big data set. It's too big to be looking at. Um, and this is even in its uh, shrunken form. So this, this data set ref uh, is uh, genetic information about a group of Native Americans that live in Arizona called the Pima Indians. Um, and the, the, the data set is really pretty big. It initially uh, com was composed of uh, 60,000 uh, columns uh, or features rather, and it's been reduced down to 12,000 or 13,000. Uh, the first thing that we do with this is we actually transpose it because it was stored in the opposite way. Uh, but that's not very interesting. So, so I'm going to do this, read in the data here, and then transpose it. And just to be sure we've done it right, so you'll see the dimensions here. There's 39 rows and about 13,000 columns. Each row here is a person. Um, and each column is, I have to confess, I don't really know so much about genetic uh, data, but I believe the way one describes this as it's the gene expression for a particular gene. So each column refers to a particular gene and something called gene expression, uh, which is probably useful information for someone who knows more about biology, um, maybe tells you something about how present this gene is, or I don't know, I, I'm not sure what exactly that information means. Um, and encoded in the rows, so again, there's 39 rows, is something about the properties of the person. So about whether or not they're male or female, and whether or not they um, are obese or not obese, lean is what that's called um, in this in the terminology here. And for some reason, so there's 10 from each of these different groups. So this means uh, lean males, uh, lean females, obese males, and obese females. Um, there's 10 from each of these groups, uh, with the exception of the obese males. There's there's only nine for that. And so that's the reason that there's 39 rows here. Uh, so there's there's 10 lean males, 10 lean females, nine obese males, and uh, 10 obese females. And this this data is you can we're going to use this to see if we can understand something. Well, we're not really going to fully do this problem, but you kind of get a flavor for it. You could try to understand something about whether or not this gene expression information somehow uh, can be used to understand uh, uh, whether or not a person is male or female or lean or obese. So the first thing I want to try to do is, so again, this is a very different data set than what we've been looking at. The number of observations is very low compared to the number of features, right? So this is sort of upside down for us. We're used to the other situation. Um, the first thing I'm going to point out is that if you try to use the older algorithm, PrinComp, uh, which I'll just do right now, you'll get an error, and the error will complain that you can't use PrinComp when the number of rows is smaller than the number of columns. Um, it, does not, it does not work. Um, but the singular value decomposition routine will work, uh, PRComp, it will do that. Um, but what it does that's different, um, the, the transformed data is not going to be on 13,000 features. It's only going to be on, um, at most, uh, the number of features is going to match the number of observations. So it's going to be on 39 different principal components. So you won't see any more than 39 principal components. But so we'll do this. Uh, we'll run the principal component. Uh, routine, and it spits out all of the 39 principal components, and you can see the standard deviation of them. Uh, well, this is just a summary of of the information that we got from the principal component analysis. But let's try to see if we can make some sense out of this. Uh, so we'll look at the size. 
And again, as I said, it's 39 by 39. We'll take a look at a scree plot to see if it's uh, if we can uh, safely eliminate a whole lot of the principal components. And it doesn't look as promising as some of the earlier things, right? So you certainly wouldn't want to just stop at the first two or three principal components. Um, there's there's quite a bit more uh, here, I think. Um, but you could do some kind of quantitative um, decision making here. But I think if you just glance at this and ask, like, where do you hit the scree or something, I would say it's maybe somewhere here. So I, I would probably want to keep the first three or four or five here. Um, but you know, you can you can come up with different schemes for this. And you probably, again, should look at the pro cumulative proportion of variance, uh, or at least the proportion of variance. All right, so we're going to look at the first two principal components just to see what information that actually tells us. Um, so see if we can actually see any patterns here, which doesn't look like we should see a whole lot because there's there's still a lot of information in the third and fourth principal components and so on. But nevertheless, we can give this a try. Uh, we'll see the first two principal components. And really, this is kind of an example to kind of not so much so that you will become an expert on the genetics of the Pima Indians, but rather on how you go about using principal component analysis, what kind of uh, commands can you run to show the various different things and so this is just how you show make a plot of the two different principal components and so you see the data scattered around here and we're going to do something similar to what we did with the cars in the last lecture and with the um uh, what was our previous data set the the countries in the previous data set where we kind of label these somehow using one of the other principal components, or we won't do that, actually. We'll use information from the original matrix, or the original data set. So we're going to try to see if we can find out on these two principal components, where do uh, obese and lean people appear? And to do that, again, since obese and lean was not something that was sort of stored in the matrix, the data matrix itself, it was like encoded in there. We're going to make a, a new vector of L's and O's. Um, the first half of them are lean and the second half are obese. This is how the encoding was done. Um, and so we'll, we'll, tr we'll put that, uh, we stored that into a vector here and we'll use that to make the labels of these points. And we'll go ahead and see if you can see some sort of pattern. And you kind of, you can see a pretty good pattern. So um, the, the O's, that seem to be uh, have a higher value of principal component two, but they don't seem to be, um, they seem to be sort of uniformly distributed, maybe a little bit larger values for principal component one. Um, we can similarly do the same kind of thing with gender, but again, it's been, it's, it's encoded into the rows. And so I'm going to have to uh, decode that in a way, in the same way. So we'll make a, uh, a vector of M's and F's for male and female, um, and then we'll plot this. And here's the result. So the males and females, I don't know if you really see any kind of pattern here. It looks to me like they're kind of uniformly, or I don't know, no pattern seems to be screaming at me. Um, but so this is the kind of exploration you can do. You can put some information about the previous uh, the original data set on your principal components and see if they help you to discriminate patterns or see patterns. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is look at a bubble plot. So it's the same kind of thing, but what we're going to plot for the radius of the bubbles is going to be the genetic expression for gene number six. Um, and so let's see how you can do that. And this is the routine for it here, or the command for it here. And we'll execute it. And so um, I don't know if you really see any strong pattern here or not about genetic expression for gene number six. At least it's not screaming out at me straight away. Um, but yeah, so this is just this is kind of a simple exploration of a relatively complex data set that had 60,000 uh, columns initially. I'm not sure how it was whittled down to 12,000, uh, but now it's still it's even uh, 12 or 13,000 columns that we can now say something about in a, in a really small compact plot. Now, whether or not we've learned anything from that plot is a different matter, 
but at least it gives us a handle on kind of how, how we might go about looking at it or how we might go about exploring the data. Okay, the last example I think is kind of fun and entertaining. Uh, it's less grim than uh, obesity and genetics. And, well, I don't know, maybe that stuff's fun too. Um, but this, this one is an image analysis uh, problem, which is kind of entertaining. Um, this comes from a collection of student uh, photos, like when you, when you get a photo for your ID. Um, I think it's from Stanford University. I'm not sure what year this was done or what year the data was collected. And I often wonder, like, do students know that this happened, that their, their uh, student photos were stored? They probably did. Uh, maybe these weren't just student ID photos. These were probably people who volunteered to have their photo taken or something. Um, but it's a large collection of photos of students. or It's not so large, actually. I think it's about 200. We'll see in a second. Um, we're going to use this routine over and over again, display matrix, to take a, a one of these student photos and display it as a picture. Um, and so that's what this routine does. It's not super crucial that we understand the details of this but you might want to um, to dig through and see if you can understand it. So for example, I said that the information is stored as grayscale, and so here's this, um, or I don't know if I said it, but it's, it's typed in here somewhere. Um, these, are, these photos are just stored as like intensity maps, um, but maybe you could change the coloring of them. Um, I don't know, you could try things like this. Um, but anyway, so that, that routine is not really so crucial. This is just tells that routine just tells us how to convert uh, each person's photo into an actual picture we can see. And so the first thing I'm going to do is load this data set. It's a bigger data set. Um, there's 200 photos, and each photo is has 10,000 pixels on a, on a that will display on a grid. Um, and again, each one is just stored as a, each pixel is just a single number. Uh, for intensity, so how dark or how light that pixel is. And so let's just take a look at the first few photos. Um, oh, and I think this is probably, we've never, I don't think we've used this before. Uh, this data is stored in a different kind of format. You can, you can take a look at it here and see what, what is, how it's stored. Um, but let's get on to the kind of interesting stuff here and, and take a look at some of these photos. So, so here's the first three. Um, they're a little big on my screen here. Uh, but there's there's some student. It's relatively pixelated. It's only ten thousand pixels. Um, and here's the next person, the next, and these are all men. Um, the the next batch, or well, the the data is stored in the first hundred are men, and the first and the next hundred are women. So you can see that here. Uh, so after one hundred, uh, you see female faces, um, and uh, so this this was just to show you that the uh, the people switch uh, halfway. So this shows images ninety eight to one hundred and three, and so sure enough, uh, so let's scroll through this. So this is ninety eight, ninety nine, one hundred, and then one hundred and one is the first female face, um, and so on, and then the re the rest are female. So. This, this is kind of an interesting data set. So I think, where did I say up here? Somewhere back past all these images. Here we go. So what we have here is we're going to treat each person as each person's picture as a feature. Um, so each row is going to be a pixel. Oh, uh, sorry. Is that, is that how I... Yeah. So, so each, each row is going to be a pixel. So it's going to be 10,000 rows and 200 columns. So each column represents uh, the amount of person that went into that pixel, say. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit of an unusual interpretation. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to reduce this down to a small number of principal components. So not 200 people, but a smaller number. And so we're, we're going to, first we're going to do it for the men and then we'll do it for the women and then we'll just do all the people together at once all right so the first thing we're going to do is is make a matrix that's just the first hundred people and we'll run principal component analysis on this and then take a look at the uh, result 
right? And so there should be a hundred principal components here. And then let's take a look at what does it look like if you, so now we take this first column of the transform data. Uh, so this new, this is principal component one and turn that into a picture uh, and see what this looks like. So this is somehow, I don't know, like a representative picture of the men. I don't know. Um, and you'll see there's a minus sign here because uh, something that it causes the display matrix routine was just showing negatives of these images. So I put a minus sign in there to make the black and white look correct. And so somehow this is supposed to be like the, the principal component one pick person uh, of the men. And if you kind of, I don't know if you kind of squint at this and, and you can, you can probably, maybe you could guess that this was a guy. I don't know. You can certainly tell it's a person. Um, it's sort of interesting to see how fast, uh, if you look at these principal components, uh, what happens when I look at the uh, higher principal component people. So more principal component men. So this, this was number one. Um, and the higher ones become strange really fast. So principal component two is it's kind of creepy looking. <laughs> Um, and then three and so on. So these, these, these faces start to look relatively strange. Um, I, I don't know, maybe that, that's not as alarming as some of the other ones. Um, and then we'll do the same thing for the women pictures. So, so we've got again, a hundred of them going from one one to 200 and we'll look at uh principal comp So we'll do the principal component analysis and we'll look at the principal component one woman. And yeah, I think you could probably make out if you, particularly, I think if you just kind of squint, <laughs> you can make out, you can for sure make out that this is a person. Um, and you could probably guess the gender. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, there's a lot of social stuff in how you might guess gender. So um, yeah, so that's principal component uh, one woman. And so let's see what some of the other principal component these people might look like or women. And again, they look pretty strange right away uh, when you go to higher principal components. Um, so they become kind of creepy, I think, right? Like this is kind of scary looking people. I mean, they're not real people. <laughs> this is, I think this is called eigenfaces, uh, this study. Uh, yeah, so these are these guys. Um, and so let's try doing just all the humans uh, at once. So don't try to assign genders to anybody. Um, and so there we'll do the principal component analysis and look at principal component one. And I think it looks pretty similar to the male principal component. Um, so let's see if we can go back there and find that. Is it the same even? No, it's a little different, um, but it, it looks similar. Uh, and then we can look at all the other ones as well. Uh, so we'll look at the first 10. And there, these are here. So this is definitely a different one from what was in the men. Um, and then we can look at the last of the principal component people. Uh, so there's 200 of these. Uh, so we'll look at the last 10. And they look still sort of recognizable as human profiles or, or face shapes. But... Uh, I'm not really sure what we're seeing here. <laughs> These are the, the way down into the scree, say. Um, yeah, so uh, I think this one's kind of fun. You, I would recommend you, uh, for all three of these examples, really, you should, and, and for all the code we do, you should write these things up as well and um, and see, you know, experiment with them and see, see what you can get uh, by changing things around in the problem. I hope you enjoyed those examples. I think they're pretty fun, and I think they give a nice feeling for kind of the breadth of, of uh, things you can do with principal component analysis. The next lecture, we're going to finish up, we're going to wrap up our, our principal component analysis discussion uh, by going over some of its flaws or some of its pitfalls or things to worry about, uh, just kind of grouping them together and, and talking about those. Until then.